Hello! In this video, we'll look at superscalar and out-of-order microprocessors. So a superscalar processor is one that has multiple copies of the data path to be able to execute multiple instructions at once. So in this example, let's say we took our pipelined RISC-V processor, and instead of reading out one instruction, we read out two instructions. Then let's say we had a register file Instead of having three ports on it, we had six ports. So we could um, fetch um, the operands for two instructions and write the results from two instructions on each step. Then instead of having a single ALU, let's say we had two of them, so we could execute two instructions on each step. And then instead of having a single ported memory, we have a double ported memory that could read and write two values per cycle, and then two result muxes. So this way, ideally, our superscalar processor could issue and execute two instructions on every cycle. Unfortunately, there are dependencies, and this sometimes limits our ability to issue multiple instructions at once, um, because one thing depends on the previous. Let's take a look at some examples to understand dependencies and understand some techniques to get around dependencies. So for starters, let's have a program with no dependencies. Say we have a load word that puts an answer in S7, then an add into S8, subtract into S9, and into S10, or into S11, and store into S5, and none of the inputs to any of these instructions depended on previous ones. So on the first cycle, we could fetch both the load and the add from the instruction memory. On the second cycle, we would read S0 and 40 for the load, T1 and T2 for the add, and meanwhile, we could fetch the subtract and the and. On the third cycle, the load and add could both do addition, and the register file could read the sources for the subtract and and, and meanwhile, we could fetch the or from the store word. On the fourth cycle, the load uses the data memory. The add doesn't need it. The ALU is doing a subtract and an AND, and the register file is reading operations for the OR and subtract. Finally, on the fifth cycle, the register file writes S7 and S8 back to for the load and add. The data memory isn't used at all by subtract or AND, and the ALU is doing OR and add for the OR and STORE instructions. So here we're issuing two instructions every cycle, and so the instructions per cycle is two. Now let's consider a superscalar processor with some dependencies. So we load into S8, but now suppose the add uses S8. And then suppose we have subtract, whose destination is also S8, and the AND depends on that S8 from the subtract. Finally, let's say we have an OR whose destination is S11 and a STORE that depends on S11. So on the first cycle, we could issue the load, but we can't do the ADD because it needs S8 that we don't yet have from the load. On the second cycle, we could issue the ADD. The ADD will go, but it stalls. And so the... Um, add needs to wait until S8 is available here in cycle 5. The subtract is independent of the add, so we could also issue that. And both of them finish up in step 7. On cycle 3, we could issue the AND and the OR. Uh, they stall as well because the add and subtract have been stalled. And finally, on cycle 5, we could issue the store. So now, it takes five cycles to issue six instructions, so the actual instructions per cycle is six-fifths, or 1.2. Better than one, but not all that great. So to try to get around these issues, we could uh, design an out-of-order microprocessor that can look ahead across multiple instructions and issue as many instructions as possible at once, uh, so long as there are no dependencies. Uh, it can issue the instructions out of order. So the dependencies we need to look for are called raw, war, and wa. In a read-after-write, 
dependency, we have one instruction that writes, and a later instruction that wants to read that register, we have to write, wait for the write to occur before we could read, or at least we need to forward. For write after read, we have one instruction that reads, and a later instruction that writes the register. The instruction that writes it can't be moved out of order before the one that reads, or we might get the wrong answer. And then in a write after write, one instruction writes a register, and then a subsequent instruction writes the same register, and we need to keep those instructions in order so that when we finish, the um, write, the, we have the result of the second instruction, not the first instruction in the register. So with an out-of-order processor and a lot of hardware, we could theoretically issue many, many instructions at a time. If we had a million execution units and a, a three million ported register file, uh, we could uh, ideally issue a lot of instructions. But in real programs, we find that there are a lot of dependencies. And even with an infinite amount of hardware, it's often not practical to issue more than three instructions on a cycle because of these dependencies. Out-of-order processors are typically built with a device called a scoreboard that keeps track of the instructions waiting to issue, the functional units available, and the dependencies between instructions. And it finds the uh, next instructions in the scoreboard that are ready to issue, that have available function units, and have all the dependencies satisfied. So let's take a look at this out-of-order processor. So. Um, we have the load word instruction. We could execute that. Um, the um, add depended on it, so we couldn't do that. But we could look far ahead in the program and find the or and issue the or at the same time as the load. Now those could run through. The or produces S11. The store needs S11. So on the next cycle, cycle two, we could issue the store and forward the results of S11 from the OR to the store. We'd like to also issue an add, but the add depended on S8, which wasn't ready yet from the load. So we would have had to stall anyway. So we can't issue the add at the same time as the store. Instead, we issue the add and the subtract in cycle three. And then finally, the and depends on the subtract, and we could issue it in cycle four. And now we've issued six instructions in four cycles to get a IPC of 1.5, which is better, but still not yet ideal. So one more technique is called register renaming. So um, we couldn't issue the subtract until after the load word because um, both of them write to S8 and there's a write after read dependency here that the subtract can't be done until after this add which has to happen after the load and then S8 the and can't happen until after the subtract so if we were willing to rename registers, and instead of the subtract be um, going to S8, let's come up with a new temporary register called R0. And then we could issue the load into S8. Simultaneously, we could issue the subtract to reg reg register R0. Then the AND that depended on the result of the subtract, now we, with the renaming hardware, that S8 has become R0. So we forward R0 from the subtract to the AND. The OR can access S11, so it can be issued simultaneously with the AND. Finally, the ADD and the STORE can be issued simultaneously. And when we're all done, uh, the processor would have to keep track that the final value of S8 is actually in this renamed register R0 instead of the original S8. So with register renaming, we can issue all six instructions in two cycles and get uh, IPC of two, which is terrific. One more technique for issuing more 
um, operations at a time is called single instruction multiple data or SIMD. And in this technique, a single instruction acts on many pieces of data at once. So a very common application for this is graphics. Machine learning is also common. And it can apply to any sort of short arithmetic operations. Sometimes this is called packed arithmetic. So let's say we had an add instruction to add eight 8-bit elements. So suppose we had 64-bit registers, D0 and D1, and we issue a packed add um, on 8-bit chunks. The registers would be treated as eight 8-bit values, and we'd get eight 8-bit sums. And any overflow between columns would be uh, disc discarded instead of affecting the next pair. So if these values were, say, pixels, we could be doing arithmetic on eight pixels simultaneously and get eight times the performance.